Once again, we want to welcome you uh, tonight at our Sunday night Bible study in which we're dealing with the end times and current events. We're delighted to have you with us. If you're here for the first time joining us, we give you a special welcome. And during the next few weeks, we are going to study together through the subject or part of the subject at least uh, concerning the doctrine of the rapture of the church. So we are going to begin with this as our first study in this tr topical prophetic study. Any study of the end times can create a variety of questions, concerns, and even confusion in our minds. Sometimes it's difficult to see how obscure passages, distant places, and unfamiliar symbols can have a significance for our lives. After all, if we can't understand what the Bible is teaching, how in the world can it have any relevance or importance to what we are experiencing today? I don't want you to miss the awesome truths God has provided for each of us in the Bible. So first of all, we need to study and learn. We need to make the connections with what scriptures are teaching us through biblical prophecy and about the current times that we are living in. Subjects such as the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming and the new heaven and the new earth. By doing this, it will help you and I live with confidence and hope in a time that seems to be filled with all kinds of uncertainty and trouble. What we must remember that prophecy is, in, is important to God and he desires for us to understand his plan for the future. There are more than 900 prophecies in the Bible concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in the Bible, God has taken great care to communicate this to you and I, us, in a way that we can understand. Jesus tells us to keep our eyes open or watch so we are not fooled by the signs indicating the end times are near. And as we get closer to the end of times, Many people are going to claim to be the Messiah and claim to have answers for our troubled world. About 50% of all the research that scientists today are involved in is in the area of arms development. And there is at least one military weapon and 4,000 pounds of explosives for every man, woman, and child on this earth. And finally, there will be more and more disease and plagues and pandemics and devastation. Today, there are millions of people in the world that are being affected by insufficient food, the spread of new diseases, plagues, and devastating effects of natural disasters. As we get further along in the end times, there will be more and more famine, starving. There will also be an increase of earthquakes and natural disasters, such as hurricanes and fires. You see, how about pestilence and the spread of even maybe new diseases? Our world will experience a ton of tragic new diseases that you and I, we or they, will be unable to control. In case you've been asleep here lately, walking around with your head in the sand and not even knowing or noticing, right now we are seeing all these types over the internet, in the newspaper, and on television, and even in our own lives uh, locally and abroad, which can then cause us anxiety, despair, and confusion. You see, when Jesus tells us to open our eyes, he does so in order to encourage 
us, you and I, to look upon him, to gaze upon him, not because this will cause all the world's problems and our problems to suddenly disappear, but because he is the Prince of Peace. You see, if we study the scriptures to find God's plan for the future, I am confident that you and I can find out that God will give us understanding through the events of tomorrow, the future, which will help us live with confidence and hope today. So let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4, and we'll lean on it as our central passage for our study tonight. Our subject for study tonight is the rapture, a message of concern, comfort, or confusion. And that title, of, a cor of course, is rooted in what we shall see in 1 Thessalonians 4. And so before we come to that passage and we look at it in detail, there are some preliminaries that we should note. Certainly one of the surest words in all of the Bible is that Jesus is coming back. Someone has said that there are at least 1,527 Old Testament references and 380 New Testament reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Take the New Testament alone, and we are not just limited to the personal testimony of what our Lord has says, where he says, I will come again. But listen to the words even of angels who were present at the moment of his ascension when they announce, made an announcement to anxious disciples. They said, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in light manner as ye have seen him go. It is the Apostle Paul who refers to the second coming as a blessed hope. And when the Apostle Peter writes, he reminds us that our faith someday shall be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus. So there is a uniformity uh, or a uniform testimony of the New Testament writers as well as the Old Testament writers is that Jesus is coming again. You see, we can count on it. Say it like you believe it. We can count on it. Now, the second coming of our Lord, which is one single event, can be looked upon as taking place in two phases or two aspects. Jesus at the conclusion of the church period is the first aspect of the second coming which shall occur and will be at the first aspect that our Lord shall return from the heavens in the air. He shall come privately and he shall come for his church. It is at that moment that the church as we know it those that are born again believers will be caught up to meet him in the air. And the second aspect of the second coming will be when he shall return to the earth and this shall be made public. It will be a public coming and he shall come with all of his saints or with his church. So between the two aspects of the second coming, there will be a seven year period of, or what is known as the great tribulation period. Now there are several or many words, some in the scriptures and some in theological language that will help us to understand the aspects of the second coming of our Lord. What I'd like to do by the way of introduction is outline with you five major words that are used to delineate certain aspects of the second coming 
or to describe the significance of each of these aspects. So let's look at five major words. The first word is that we want to talk about very simply and briefly is the word coming. You see, that is a word that comes from a Greek verb that occurs oftentimes throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament to describe this very significant event. It is a very general term and has no particular technical significance. The verb coming is used to refer to both aspects, the first aspect and the second aspect. The Lord Jesus said in relation to the communion service and at the Lord's Supper, Supper, he said, this do till I come. On again, another occasion, he says, behold, I come quickly. And so that verb come is used many times in relation to the first aspect. He shall come through the air and he shall come for, for the church, you and I. That same verb is used on many occasions for the second aspect of his coming. Matthew 24, which we've been reading, I think we've gotten down, uh, down into the th uh, verse 30-something there. Um, it gives us detail that the second aspect, and frequently those two chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, use the verb come. And so when we speak of the second coming, we are speaking of one single event with two different aspects to it. The verb coming neatly ties together these two aspects and they give us one single word. The second word that I'd like us to uh, look at that we want to note is really the transliteration of a Greek word and the word is parousia. The, the parousia is the transliteration of the Greek word parousia, which means basically presence. Now pay attention here because I found this a wonderful thing. This was actually a cultic expression that was used for the visit of a, a hidden de a deity who would come and visit and by his visit would make his presence known. Stay with me here. And in that cult, they would either celebrate his presence in the cult or they would be aware of his presence by supernatural divine demonstration of power. And when they referred to the presence of that deity, they spoke it, of it in the terms of parousia or parousi. It is also an official term or an official expression of the first visit of a person of high rank like a governor or a emperor or a king who would visit a prominent providence in an official state visit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as we shall read in a few moments, we find in verse 15, when the Apostle Paul speaks of those who shall be alive at the coming, and that is the word, the parousia, the coming of the Lord or the presence of the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and verse 8, it is used in relation to his coming to the earth and with his church. So let's look at the third word that we should know, and that will help us in our understanding of this subject. And it is the word rapture. Now the word rapture is the only one of the five words that we're taking a look at that we're going to speak on, which does not literally appear in the New Testament. However, the word rapture is an English word which is derived from a Latin translation of 1 Thessalonians 4, 
verses 16 and 17, where we read that we who are alive and shall remain shall be caught up, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. <clears throat> the Latin translation of the verb is rapio, and that is the root verb from which the translation comes from, and we have derived an English word from that Latin word. And the English word that we have derived is the word rapture. Now, the Greek word that is used here for caught up is a very picturesque word. It is a word that suggests two primary thoughts. The first thought is the idea of a robbery. It is used in Matthew 12 when the Lord talks about thieves breaking into a house and stealing something. There is a robbery that is involved. And also the second thought is that of something that is violent, something that is sudden and something that is almost catastrophic. The Lord anticipates that usage when he uses this very word in John 16, 15, where we read that when he perceived that they would take him by force to make him king, he departed from them. He uses this same word. So the word that is used here suggests from that the English word is rapture. That, of course, is exactly the significance. Now, the rapture fits in as a descriptive phrase for the first aspect of the second coming of our Lord. It is the moment that he shall come to the earth and he shall seize and carry off those who are believers in Jesus Christ. They will be caught up together with him. It's going to be a robbery. It is going to be something that will be violent and sudden. And that is why it is described as that which initiates the day of the Lord, which in 1 Thessalonians 5 is described as a coming as a thief in the night. The Lord shall come in the air and he shall in an act of sudden robbery, snatch away from the earth those who are believers in him. So when we use the word rapture, we are speaking of the first aspect of the second coming of our Lord. Now the fourth word that we want to speak of is the word that is oftentimes attached to the names of churches. And that word is the word epiphany. The word epiphany is again a transliteration of a Greek word, epiphania, which means appearance. This is used several occasions in relation to the second aspect of the second coming. It is used, for example, in the beautiful text we find in Titus 2.13, where the Apostle Paul says, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing. It was a technical term that was used in the days of the New Testament for the visible manifestation of a hidden deity. So when the Apostle Paul and the Spirit of God takes this word out of its secular use and applies it to the coming again of our Lord Jesus, the, con the connotation is that the hidden de deity someday shall appear and he shall be seen. That will take place at the second aspect of the second coming of our Lord. This will be an epiphany. That makes it in contrast with the rapture because the rapture shall be something that will be private. That shall be unseen by the world. And in the second aspect, he shall appear and the world will then see him. Revelation tells us that every eye shall behold him. And so the epiphany is the appearance of Jesus Christ on earth before the eyes of the whole world. 
The last word that we should notice also describes the second aspect of his second coming, and that word is the word revelation. That is used on many occasions also in the scripture to refer to the second coming of our Lord. One of the most beautiful places it's used is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, where we read, And he shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That word revelation suggests an unveiling. The unveiling shall take place when Jesus Christ returns to the earth. He who is rejected by the world, he who is unknown by the world, shall someday be revealed to the world. It is in that moment, in that revelation, that takes place in the world, then shall realize he is God, who he says he is. It is at that moment that the Jewish nation shall recognize him as their Messiah, and they shall mourn over him whom they have crucified. And so the second aspect of the second coming of our Lord will be an appearance. The second coming is one event with two aspects. The first aspect is a rapture. The second aspect is a revelation and an appearance. Together, they form the parousia, which initiates the presence of ap the absent Lord. And we'd like to do it by studying this tonight, that the rapture as a message of comfort. There are actually four major views in relation to the rapture. So the message of comfort. Tonight, though, we're going to be studying it as a message of comfort. We will be reading from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 8. In those verses, the Apostle Paul, in discussing the rapture in verses 13, and 14. He gives us a bold declaration. Listen to it. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, that ye, shall, ye saw not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe, or because we do believe, that Jesus died and rose again, and even so them also who sleep in Jesus or who sleep through Jesus as it is literally is, those who sleep through Jesus will God bring with him. That is a bold declaration. And then now a little further in verses 15 through 17, you have a very explicit explanation of how this shall take place. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming, there it is, the word parousia, of the Lord shall not proceed. The old King James uses an old English word prevent, which means proceed. Them who are asleep for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with a voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be raptured. That is the way the Latin translation renders it. Shall be raptured or shall be seized and carried off together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air so shall we be with the Lord. Verse 18 gives us his very direct exertion. It says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, so what I'd like to continue to do then in our study of this section of Scripture in Thessalonians is talk about the declaration, the explanation, and the exhortation that's given in these verses. So number one, the declaration. The declaration that we read in verses 13 and 14 is based upon a serious uh, question that has come up 
in the minds of the Thessalonians. It will be obvious to us that this question concerns them who are asleep. That is exactly what we read in verse 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep. Now the verb to be asleep is only used in the New Testament of believers. It suggests the peacefulness, the tranquility of a person who has died believing in Jesus Christ. That is from our point of view, from the point of view of a person who is alive on earth. And one who has died believing in Jesus Christ has fallen asleep. It is the picture or the imagery is that of a mother who's rocking their baby uh, to sleep in a rocking chair after maybe giving birth, ba the baby the bottle and singing a song or two and reading a little story and then she leans back in her chair and she loves the baby to sleep. That is exactly the imagery that Paul is picturing of a death of a believer. So now in the absence of the Apostle Paul, many have died. And now the question has come, what shall be the relationship of those who have died as believers? Those who have been lulled to sleep by Jesus and his second coming to establish the kingdom and to reign on earth. These people had suffered for the sake of the kingdom. Some perhaps have been persecuted and even have been martyred, killed for the cause of Christ. And now the question in the mind of the Thessalonians is this. Shall they miss out on the kingdom? Shall they miss out on all the glory of the second coming? Shall they have no part of great honor or seeing him establish his kingdom and reign on earth? That was the thing that was concerning them so desperately. So now Paul recognizes that this question in the minds of the Thessalonians is a very serious question because it is causing them to be grieved and to sorrow so that the grief, their grief and their sorrow is tending towards the same type of hopelessness that characterize the unbelievers who in fact, have no hope. You see, so Paul says, I do not want you to be like these unbelievers. Let me tell you exactly what the relationship shall be of those who have been lulled to sleep and the establishment of the kingdom. He makes his declaration in the concluding phrase of verse 14 when he says, even so, them also who sleep through Jesus will God bring with him. The answer is that when Jesus returns, God will bring with him those who have slept in Christ. They shall return to the earth with him and they shall share in the kingdom and they shall see all the glories of his kingdom reign. You see, that is the answer that Paul offers to the Thessalonians. When he returns to the earth and establishes his kingdom, they shall be with him and they shall see the glory of the millennial kingdom, that thousand year reign, and they shall share with him in that glorious millennial 1000 year reign. He has answered the question, only, of course, to raise a hundred other questions. How can it all take place? What will be the sequence of events? They have died, but how shall they come back with him? Paul gives us his explanation in verses 15 through 17. So in order to explain how this shall take place, Paul gives us this explanation. He tells us the sequence of events, the course of events that shall take place, whereby those who have fallen asleep in Jesus shall indeed come back with him. 
It says, and I think we can divide the explanation into two parts. The verse 15, you have a general statement. Then in verses 16 and 17, you have the explanation in detail. So let's look at this explanation in general in verse 15. It says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And so what he does, he introduces his explanation with this statement that what he is about now to tell us is by the word of the Lord. Paul says, what I am about to tell you, the sequence of the events that I am about to explore, the revelation that I am about to give to you has come by revelation, direct revelation from God. The second thing he gives us in this general statement in verse 15 is that the living saints, those that are alive at the time of the coming of the Lord or the return of the Lord, shall not precede or come before those who are asleep. That is, he is simply telling us that the translation or the rapture, the taking up, of the living saints shall not proceed or happen before the resurrection of the dead saints. Now that is a very important thing for these Thessalonians to realize. If the taking up or the rapture of the living saints precede the resurrection of the dead saints, then it's suggested that the dead saints mess, miss, may miss out on Jesus' second coming in his return to the earth and the establishment of his kingdom. So here's the explanation. Now, what does it all mean? In verses 16 and 17, then we will have specific events and specific details. Really, you have a sequence of events that will take place whereby when our Lord returns to the earth in his epiphany, and revelation, those who have died in Christ shall come back with him. If you look carefully in these verses, you'll find there are five events given to us in a sequence of order. Number one, the descending. You see, the first event is in verse 16. It says there, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. That is the first event in the sequence. It is, of, co of course, the descending of Jesus Christ. And now we know from later texts that he does not descend to the earth. He descends only in the air. Three things, apparently, will accompany the moment of the descending. The first thing is that he shall descend with a shout. That is a very graphic word in the original language. It means a shouted command, just like as a command would be shouted by the captain of a ship or, uh, or to the, his oarsmen, or as a command would be shouted by the general of his troops. So someday Christ is going to descend with a shouted command. What will be the command relate? What will it relate to? It shall relate to the resurrection of those who are asleep in Jesus. He shall descend to the air with a shouted command that will command those who are asleep in Jesus, speaking of, of course, their physical bodies, to be raised again from the dead. This was what was predicted in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 28, when our Lord says, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. And I think it was illustrated at the tomb of Lazarus. It says in the scripture that he shouted with a loud voice and a shouted command, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. It was the restoration to life. It will be directed towards those who are asleep in Jesus. And it will be his command for them to come forth. 
The second thing that will be associated with that dissension is it will be with the voice of an archangel. The voice of the archangel, I suggest to you, perhaps may be the thing that will gather together from all the courts of heaven and all the corners of the earth, the angelic forces. I argue this because in every massive movement of Jesus Christ through his life and after his life, as well as many of the momentous events in the Old Testament, there was angelic accompaniment. The thing that will congregate the angels around him for the wonderful moment of his descension from heaven to the air will be the voice of the archangel, the archangel Michael. You see, the third is the trump of God. Have you ever noticed that whenever God appeared to Israel, especially in the moments like Exodus 19, to reveal himself to them, that it, there, it was the sound of a trumpet that gathered together the nation of Israel to hear what God would say to them. You see, it was the sound of a trumpet that gave commands to Israel to break camp and start the procession in their march. And in the days of the Roman army, it would be the sound of a trumpet that issued the commands for the soldiers to stop or for the soldiers to move forward or for the soldiers to make camp. You see, the sounds of the trumpet, the trump of God shall be sounded. And I suggest to you that it will be this trumpet sound that will be the calling signal for all of the living saints on the earth to respond to this moment of our Lord's ascension or descension. You see, when he descends in this first act, that comprises the rapture, when he descends then to the air, it will be with the uh, archangel and the congregating of the saint angels. It will be with the trump of God directed to the living saints, gathering them together and issuing the command for them to come and to meet him in the air. And next there's the resurrection. We're all really familiar with that. Verse 16, it carries us quickly to the second event of his sequence of the words. And the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Several things here should be noticed about this resurrection. The first is that it is the res resurrection of those who are dead in Christ. That is, it is a very technical phrase, which applies to those who believe in Christ during the church age. One becomes in Christ, baptized by the Holy Spirit. So when it says that the dead in Christ shall be raised first, it is referring to persons through this church period. It will be a resurrection to a resurrected body. This is going to be, in my estimation, one of the most dramatic demonstrations of divine power anywhere ever to be demonstrated. He, God, shall resurrect those who have died in Christ and give to them a resurrection body. First, uh, First Corinthians 15 describes that resurrection body as being identical in identity with you today, which means that we shall recognize each other in heaven. I don't think there is any question about that. Although the body shall be different in essence or different in its qualities, it shall be identical with the identity of a person today. It certainly shall be different in its qualities. Just take a look at us. It shall be a spiritual body. It shall be a body that will take on incorruption and immortality. It will be a new miraculous work of God. You see, those that are concerned tonight about shall be raised first before the translation or the rapture of the church. They surely shall not miss out on the blessings of the kingdom when he shall return to his establish to establish the kingdom. Next is the translation. 
That brings us to the third event is in verse 17 where we read, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And that is the translation or the rapture of the saints. And this is going to be by a forceful snatching away of believers in Jesus Christ from the earth. My friends, if it happened at this very moment, it would be much like lowering a magnet upon a table that had a a heap of nails and matches And guess which ones would be left behind? It would be the matches, of course. When our Lord returns, he is going to give a command and the sound of the trumpet so that in response to the command, the dead in Christ shall be resurrected and leave in the graves of those who have died without believing in Christ for the judgment of God. The striking thing, I think, is about this whole phrase is that This translation, this rapture will be accompanied by clouds. Think about this. Notice it says, they shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. Have you ever noticed that clouds invariably are associated with divine manifestation? Clouds oftentimes are associated with the second coming of the Lord. And I believe it will be literal clouds. I don't think there is any reason at all for suggesting anything other than literal clouds at this very moment that it happens. You see, that may be by the means whereby the hidden departure of the saints will take, will take place. There will be such a cloudy phenomenon at the time that the rapture will take place unknowingly to the world. And after the rapture takes place, believers obviously will be missed, just like Elijah was missed. You see, they searched for him, but there's no indication that there will be a repentance on the part of an unbeliever after the rapture. Salvation during the tribulation period will be as a result of the ministry of the 144,000 that we read about to whom the gospel message will be revealed by God. There is no indication that the rapture will cause a great turning to God so that if it took place today, every indication from the scriptures is that our children would not immediately repent or the neighbors that we have been witnessing to would not immediately put their finger on it and identify it as the rapture and turn and then believe God. You see, mankind has the facility to explain away naturalistic, supernatural things. One of the things, perhaps, may permit mankind from such a naturalistic explanation will be the accomplishment of the accompaniment of some kind of a cloudy phenomenon occurring into which the church will be raptured and then disappear. And then there is the rendezvous. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, close real quickly by pointing out to you that the next event is a great rendezvous. It is for a meeting of the Lord in the air. It is not to meet but it is for a meeting. And the Lord that is used here is a very technical word that suggests the welcoming committee going out to welcome a dignitary. When Paul came to Rome in Acts 28, the brethren from Rome came out for a meeting. The same word is used here. You see, they were an official delegation coming out to welcome him. And that is a beautiful picture of the church. So I picture them, the rapture of the church as an official delegation going out from the earth to be the welcoming committee for the Lord as he returns to the earth. There shall be a seven year interval though during which mankind will have to sit at the judgment seat of Christ but the rapture 
is a beautiful picture of the faithful, the remnant on earth, and in the grave going out to welcoming our Lord as he returns to establish his kingdom. The permanent association, the last is a permanent association of that is what you have in verse 17. 17. So shall we ever be with the Lord. The permanent association is that we shall be with him during the seven-year period in the air. We shall be with him when he returns to the earth to establish his kingdom. We shall be with him during the thousand-year reign of his kingdom here on earth. And we shall be with him through all, throughout all of eternity. And that, of course, is the great message that Paul has. As a result, his exhortation in verse 18 is, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Those that you are so concerned about shall not miss out in the kingdom. Those, they shall be with him when he returns to the earth. Together they shall go in the air for a meeting of the Lord and they shall be with him when he returns to establish his reign on earth. That is the message of the rapture. It is a message of comfort. And last but not least, the exhortation. Down through the years, these chapters and verses have been a message of comfort for untold thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of believers. And that is exactly what the chapter is for us tonight. It is a word of comfort. Imagine for a moment the tremendous comfort that is found in the prospect of a great reunion with those who have gone on before us, believers in Christ. I have a mom and that I'm going to meet in the air that day. It is going to be a grand reunion. Imagine the comfort that there is in the prospect of the great joy of being part of that welcoming committee. You are going to be part of that, Christians. If you are a believer, imagine the joy and the comfort that there is in the prospect of the great glory of God, of being with him while he reigns on the earth. That is the message of the rapture. There is also the great comfort that comes in the, the, with the assurance of a great deliverance from the tribulation period. That is that the church shall be raptured and delivered from the earth before the great tribulation breaks out upon the earth. So, of course, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ tonight, there is no comfort in these words. They will seal your eternal doom to be without God and without hope forever and ever. So I want to encourage you tonight, friends, if you have never believed in Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior, that you trust Him and accept Him as your Lord and Savior so that you will be with Him and like Him forever and ever. Father, we pray in Jesus' mighty name and we ask your blessing on this message. And we thank you for the comfort that there is for us tonight, as well as those of old, in the great promise of the resurrection for the dead of Christ. And the rapture of those who are living and believing in you. We pray that you will help us to look for that day, to watch, to live for this week in the light of the fact that it may be today. For we ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name.